Okay. MD. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. So we we're starting soon. We just wait for a few more moments for attendees to join. I can see also Matteo Fermeglia just joined. Hi Matteo. So good afternoon. We're st we're starting soon. I see the number, the counter of the attendees growing. Let's wait for more for a few more moments. <laughs> Okay, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Maurizio Cocchi, and on behalf of the UBCE and of ETA Florence, I'd like to welcome you to this event, Squaring the Circle Between Phytoremediation and Biofuel Production. So this, uh, this uh, side event has a double purpose. One is to inform about uh, the activities of uh, a series of ongoing research and innovation projects funded by the European Union through Horizon program. And they, are, they have a quite similar objective, but of course with different approaches and methodologies that is to combine um, sustainable biofuel production with uh, phytoremediation and the recovery of uh, contaminated land. And this is one of the uh, aim of the event. And the other is to um, discuss uh, on the regulatory uh, barriers and the regulatory aspects that still hamper the uh, full um, uptake and the full realization of the potential of uh, uh, phytoremediation through the use of uh, energy crops and through, with the combination of uh, um, biofuel production. So we will have an opening remark by the European Commission, uh, the GRTD, uh, in the person of Maria Giorgiado. We will have also, we will have after three presentations on the projects that I just mentioned, one by uh, the European Commission's Joint Research Center on the EU soil strategy, uh, final wrap up, and the panel discussion on the role of policy and regulation in Europe. Uh, all the presentations will be available in the, um, in the files tab of the platform. The recordings will be also available soon after the event and they will be available uh, for public. Uh, you can type your questions in the chat and uh, co colleagues here will look after me and the colleagues will look after the questions and address them to the speakers after. So with this, I would like to introduce our first speaker, Maria Giorgiado, for her opening remarks and uh, some updates on the research innovation policy and what is happening in Brussels. Maria, thank you for your availability and the floor is yours. Thank you, Maurizio, uh, for the introduction. I am glad uh, to participate in this event uh, because all these uh, three projects uh, stem from uh, topics that we have uh, put forward uh, under the um, work programs uh, in Horizon 2020. And uh, it is time to see collectively what are the fruits uh, coming out from uh, this uh, support of this type of research. I would like to give you an idea of um, uh, what, where the research and uh, innovation policy is going under horizon uh, in Europe. And uh, I will, uh, uh, I hope you can see. Yes. Yes, we can. Yes, fine. And, um, okay. And uh, to go further, First, uh, I will tell you a little bit about uh, the uh, um, climate and energy policy, the overall uh, uh, framework under which uh, the research and innovation policy also fits. And uh, then I will uh, show you the research and innovation actions that we have uh, currently uh, put forward. The European Green Deal is the overarching policy. And uh, this is a way to transform the economy of the EU to a sustainable future. 
with interventions to all economic sectors, the industry, the mobility, the energy, the uh, food industry, and also respecting uh, the uh, uh, environment, uh, not to pollute it, uh, the ecosystems and the biodiversity, and putting high ambitions for the climate, greenhouse gas emission savings, uh, financing this transition, creating this way uh, growth and, uh, and uh, prosperity, and also financing and also not leaving anyone behind. And the policies uh, that support this overarching framework are the uh, basically the climate law with a 55% uh, net greenhouse gas emissions reduction in 2030 and the climate neutrality 2050 are the um, uh, an energy system integration where a specific uh, mention is uh, made for renewables, for sustainable biomass, biofuels, green hydrogen, synthetic fuels, the hydrogen uh, strategy with hydrogen and hydrogen derived fuels, and also biodiversity and smart mobility. Uh, to deliver for this uh, uh, green deal, we have uh, the package of uh, 15 actually legislations that are new or uh, amended, which is called Fit for 55 and affect the climate, the energy, the transport, and the taxation and trade. And the most important ones uh, are the Renewable Energy Directive uh, revision. We have a target which is quite high for the renewable energy into the energy mix of the EU by 2030, 40%, and specific targets for advanced biofuels, biogas, and renewable fuels of non-biological origin. Also, we have other regulations that target the uh, savings of greenhouse gas emissions with increased targets, like the revision of the effort sharing regulation, the emissions trading system directive, which now expands to maritime aviation and from 2026 on buildings and road transport, uh, the increased target for the land, the use land change and forest regulation, uh, and two specific proposals that are in new for fuels, one in aviation and one in maritime, with uh, specific uh, percentages of uh, consumption of uh, um, uh, sustainable uh, aviation or alternative fuels in aviation or in maritime or a, a specific uh, greenhouse gas uh, um, reduction target uh, for the maritime in particular to be done through the biogas, the biofuels, the renewable fuels of non-biological origins, etc. And another important uh, uh, revision is the energy taxation directive that uh, policies exemptions, at least this is a proposal at the moment, for the renewable fuels, the advanced biofuels, uh, biolipids, biogases, and biomass. Fuels. The newest uh, uh, action uh, now that uh, tries to reply to the uh, energy crisis um, is the Repower EU. This is a joint uh, European action uh, that uh, intends uh, to have more affordable, secure, and sustainable energy. The communication was out uh, on 8th of March. Um, and uh, we have now, uh, we are now preparing actually the implementation of uh, this uh, action plan with a communication that will be released uh, next, uh, next week. Actually, what is this Repower EU? It is uh, uh, an effort to uh, re increase the resilience of uh, the EU energy system. And this will be done by controlling the energy prices, by securing uh, the gas storage. Uh, for the next uh, heating period and by reducing the dependency on fossil fuel imports through rolling out the production of biomethane and hydrogen, through uh, changing the technologies in industry and decarbonizing it and through increasing the use of the renewable energy. So um, first we need to speed up in the permitting of renewables, renewable energy projects and for grid infrastructure uh, projects. Then uh, for the rolling out of the solar uh, energy, need more solar panels, rooftop, more heat pumps, and more energy, energy savings. Then for the gas uh, uh, diversification is to find new suppliers and have more gas storage, as I said. Um, also, there is an action to double the goal for the biomethane production from uh, 17 to 35 billion cubic uh, meters in uh, 2030 per year. And this uh, should be done locally from uh, uh, EU uh, resources. 
There is a whole program on hydrogen accelerator in order to develop infrastructure, short storage facilities and ports, and to provide an additional 15 million tons of renewable hydrogen, five produced domestically and 10 imported. And then uh, decarbonizing industry, as I said, by either uh, switching to uh, new technologies based on electrification, uh, assuming that will be renewable electricity and renewable hydrogen, or by changing the fuels, uh, so uh, to, to enhance uh, the, the new technologies to decarbonize industry. That is the overall context, and the research and innovation uh, activities are uh, covered under the uh, research and innovation framework program of 2021-2027, which is a horizon Europe. And energy plays a role under all the pillars of this uh, program, from the defense to the, to the Euro, to, but the renewable energy is uh, basically covered uh, in the specific program. And uh, in all three pillars, but in pillar two, we have a particular uh, area of cluster five, which combines climate, energy, and mobility research and innovation activities and has a, itself a budget of 15 billion for the, the three areas. And a lot of uh, attention is uh, given to renewables energy, renewable energy, and in particular uh, also including uh, renewable fuels. So for the cluster five, uh, the, the impact uh, to be achieved is to have more efficient, uh, clean, uh, sustainable, secure, competitive energy supply. Uh, through more renewable energy solutions and uh, grids, of course. And under this, to, to one way to achieve this impact is to foster the European global leadership in affordable, secure, and sustainable renewable energy technologies together with grids and CCUs. And uh, in this area, both renewable energy technologies and uh, um, renewable fuels play a role for the carbonizing uh, uh, all. Uh, consuming energy sectors. In the fuels, uh, we have uh, actions both for advanced biofuels and uh, synthetic renewable fuels that are produced from, from hydrogen. And uh, uh, these are important, as I said. Uh, so the actions uh, are long-term, like those that make sure that we have available disruptive technologies uh, and systems in 2050, but also are more short term and medium term, like to reduce the cost and improve the efficiency of the technologies, or the more mature technologies to de-risk them, to, uh, to push them to commercial exploitation, to integrate them in uh, industry consuming sectors, and uh, also to um, have a more effective market uptake. Of course, uh, we also have actions to enhance the sustainability of uh, these technologies and to reinforce the European scientific uh, basis and European uh, export potential of the technologies. So here are some uh, a summary of the topics covered in 21-22 uh, work program under this area. For renewable fuel topics, uh, we covered all PRLs from uh, very fundamental to very uh, uh, high uh, demonstration PRL, up to PRL 7 at the end of the projects. So we have uh, research uh, on uh, particular uh, uh, processes like uh, catalysis or uh, particular products like uh, have uh, carbon negative biofuel production or algal biofuels or biomethane. Also more systemic topics uh, like to have um, full value chains uh, and uh, advanced biofuels produced in uh, existing uh, infrastructure and also um, more uh, more general on renewable ca carriers and renewable fuels rather than advanced biofuels and bioenergy carriers and international cooperation, including also uh, solar fuels and artificial photosynthesis. Also, we have bioenergy topics in CHP and uh, um, the conversion of um, cleaner, cleaner technologies also in uh, combustion of and gasification uh, of uh, biomass and, uh, and heating technologies. Now, the ones that I find uh, uh, more relevant here uh, topics, and uh, they will be still open uh, in the coming um, months, are the, the, the three that I list in this uh, slide. One is the renewable energy incorporation in agriculture and forestry. This is a topic actually combining 
different renewables and adopt storage solutions uh, uh, during the, the seasons in order to, to have uh, um, a better um, uh, dealing of uh, the seasonal energy demand and manage the agricultural waste and uh, the land management of the forest waste also. And this is going to be uh, closed on uh, October 2022. Another one is a more systemic topic on uh, demonstration of complete value chains uh, for advanced biofuel or non biological renewable fuel production. Uh, there, uh, these are fuels without uh, hydrogen, is not uh, the, the final product there. And another one on best international practice for scaling up sustainable biofuels put in uh, these uh, complete value chains uh, at the international context. So these are do not really specify from which uh, kind of uh, land the feedstock is going to be resourced, but it, uh, they, they specify the, uh, the needs that we have uh, in these uh, more or less uh, agri topics uh, or forest topics or complete value chains and uh, international topics to have this type of, um, of uh, production. I would like also to mention to you uh, a topic which uh, um, arises uh, from the uh, EU Catalyst Partnership. And this partnership uh, is a partnership between uh, the Commission and uh, the, of the EU and the Catalyst Breakthrough uh, Foundation and uh, supports uh, uh, four areas, the clean hydrogen, the direct air capsule, but also the sustainable aviation fuels and uh, the long duration energy storage. It offers uh, different forms of uh, finance to close the financing gap of the project, grants and other types of uh, investments, such as quasi uh, equity. And uh, um, it will uh, have a budget of uh, $1 billion. Uh, so how this, uh, the projects also should put 50% of, uh, of the budget here in this uh, topic. But uh, how it is run, it is run through a topic. The topic is uh, the rather actions uh, in uh, Horizon uh, Web Program uh, under Cluster 5. It is action seven. It is called contribution to invest in blending operation under the green transition product. And uh, it, this is actually a framework which identifies uh, projects, European projects, to deploy these innovative technologies, listed uh, along with business models and, and approaches to reduce uh, the, uh, the difference between the cost and the price. And um, it will uh, work through the IEB, actually. The IEB will uh, give loans on quasi uh, equity drawn from uh, innovation fund or from the horizon europe or from the invest EU, depending on the size of, of uh, the project and uh, uh, it will be the eligibility of this will be uh, judged by the commission by us while the uh, financial viability will be uh, judged by the bank and uh, also the, the due diligence so this uh, is opened and um, uh, it is in the um, and work program that it is uh, published. For the mission innovation, this is another way uh, of um, collaborating and an, an activity that it is supported uh, recently. We have the mission innovation number two now, phase two, which launched, was launched last year, and it runs for the next decade for international cooperation in research development demonstration for clean energy. And uh, there are two ways of collaborating there under the innovation platform and the various modules that it has. And uh, there is a collaborative uh, module that refers to sustainable aviation fuels. Uh, and uh, this is uh, actually to have partnerships and put the forward topics uh, to make uh, sustainable cost-effective uh, strategies for sustainable aviation fuels. And it, uh, they are co-led by India and uh, USA, where we participate with several other members. And uh, the other way of collaborating is under the missions. Uh, the missions uh, are very focused now, and it is the key aspect of mission innovation too. They have um, a specific focus, and they create alliances between countries, corporations, investors, and research institutes for achieving their goal. There are several of them. I list, uh, for example, the power mission, the shipping mission, the hydrogen mission, the dioxide removal mission, etc. 
But uh, for bio, we have the integrated biorefineries that was recently launched and co-led by India and Netherlands, where Brazil, Canada, UK, and EU participate. And the goal there is to accelerate the commercialization of integrated biorefineries in order to replace 10% of fossil-based fuels, chemicals, and materials with bio-based alternatives by 2030. So I think uh, that was uh, the most uh, recent updates uh, from the uh, European Commission. Thank you very much uh, for your attention. And um, I will um, Thank you. be happy Thank you. to make additional clarifications if uh, need to be. Thank you, Maria. This is always uh, extremely useful for both those who work in the European projects uh, and to understand what is uh, the, the, the current always evolving framework of the EU policy, because it's not always easy to stay updated with it. Uh, I don't see any questions in the chat. I repeat uh, uh, a reminder the attendees, you can type your questions in the chat. Is, if other speakers have any questions, you can address now, otherwise, I know that Maria uh, will have other commitments uh, and she will have to leave soon. So I think I think uh, it's okay. Maria, uh, thanks a lot. Uh, I know I know you will uh, you cannot stay for the whole duration of the event. Feel free to stay as long as you can. and uh, thanks for your availability. And uh, see you soon, hopefully. Thank <laughs> and you thanks so much. Have a nice event. Okay, thank you. And uh, I would now like now to now we are ready to go into the details of the three projects. Uh, with the first one from the first presentation will be from uh, Effie Alexopoulos from uh, Center for Renewable Energy Sources of Greece. Uh, and uh, she will uh, introduce the activities of the project GOLD, Growing Energy Crops on Contaminated Land for Biofuels and Soil Remediation. Effie, the floor is yours. Thank you. Mauricio, thank you very much for the introduction. First of all, I would like to thank you. Uh, first of all, Maria Georgiadou for being in this event, and moreover, the other two coordinators of Pito to Climate and Keresis project that uh, um, Great to have this uh, meeting all together, the three projects. So uh, let's go to Gold Project. I'm going to present very briefly what is the main aim of this project, that it was funding by RES 37, and it's actually the sister project with other two. So if we move to the next uh, slide, we will see what was the, ma the main aim. It was to produce clean, low I look biofuels, how? By growing selected high yielding lignocellulose crops where on contaminated lands in order in long, in long term to clean them if possible and go back to the agriculture. Uh, in this uh, slide, you can see what was the driving forces to propose this proposal. Uh, it was done two years ago, and if we go back, we can see that maybe some things have been rapidly changed, especially after COVID and after the war in Ukraine. But let's stay on the contaminated lands that is approximately 2.5 million sites in Europe cannot be used for food and feed. Peter remediation is a clean solution, a green and there are energy crops like the lignocellulosic proposed by coal that they can be grown on a polluted size and they can produce feedstock for advanced biofuels. And on the other hand, we have the biofuels with low I look, the Red Dude Directive. Uh, the fact that uh, we can use the abandoned and unused land, that uh, also the lands that have been seriously degraded. We had the target of 14% for biofuels with lower risk by 2030, and energy crops can provide that feedstock uh, with low I look risks. Uh, next slide. Which are the main objectives? The, uh, the structure of gold is very simple. So in work package one, we have to optimize the selected lignocellulose crops selected by gold for phytoremediation purposes. Uh, we have then to convert the feedstock produced uh, in biofuels 
and to ensure that the contaminants that have been uh, extracted by the crops, they are not in the uh, biofuels, but we manage to collect them in a concentrated form. And then in work package three, we have to make the bridge between the crops and the, and the uh, biofuels, and we have to optimize it. Uh, of course, as all the projects, we have dissemination, communication that is very important. We have to boost the international collaboration that is a key issue for us. And of course, always there is a management and coordination of each European project. Let's move to the next, please. This is the idea of uh, the three pillars of gold. First of all, energy crops growing on contaminated land. We face, we include both organic and inorganic pollutants. Pillar number two, uh, to produce biofuels with low high risk and to take the contaminants in the concentrated forms. In this, uh, um, in biofuels, we follow and two uh, ways of processing. And finally, to optimize the value chains in terms of cost, sustainability, and SDGs. Uh, this is the core of the project. So next slide, please. Which were the crops were selected? We selected two perennial grasses, miscanthus and switchgrass, and two annual herbaceous crop, sorghum and industrial hemp, because we had sound evidence that these crops can be grown successfully on contaminated plants and can uh, successfully uh, contribute to phytoremediation. Special attention was given uh, to follow a low input uh, practices in order to be as sustainable as possible. And you can see in the graph, what are the main uh, parameters of this low input strategy? Let's go to the next. Uh, as I mentioned before, we face in gold both organic and inorganic. So we have two uh, strategies, uh, two phytoremediation strategies, bioaccumulation and phytoextraction. And we use as practices mycorrhiza and biostimulants. So far, we started, just to mention that we started almost a year ago. Uh, when we started, we had to do uh, pot trials to select which uh, phytoremediation strategy we have to follow in each site. And now at this stage, we establish all the field trials, both in Europe and Asia. Let's move to the next slide, just to see which are these places. You can see that we cover more the most uh, geographical areas in Europe, two sites in Greece, one in Italy. We have Portugal, France, Poland, and uh, we have also the Netherlands to contribute to us as to the scenarios. You can see the problem, the description in each site, and which is the main problem in terms of pollutants. And at the same time, we have two institutes from uh, China and one from India. So more or less, we cover the international collaboration. Let's move to the next. Uh, this is the two way of processing that we adapted in gold. The first was based on European partners. So here we have a nice collaboration among TNO, Record, TUM, and CERTH. Uh, we follow three ways of uh, pretreatment, torgos, torrefaction, and pyrolysis. And we do high thermal gasification. And after gas cleaning, we do syngas fermentation. Keeping note that the, the project is research uh, innovation, is research project. The second route is by University of, of Selbrook, where they are doing, uh, they, there is a combination that they can do it both uh, gasification and pyrolysis. And um, I don't have enough time to present, but we try to have um, a collaboration between the two routes in order to have a real interaction among the, uh, the partners. If we move to the next slide, you can see that some humic acids that they are going to produce from the torways, they, uh, they are going to be tested, first of all, on port trials and maybe, if possible, on the fields, in, uh, in, in the fields of, the, of gold. Let's, uh, let's move to the next. So, the specific uh, impact of gold. 
The main aim, the main target was to create win-win situation by bridging polluted land back to the agriculture through cost reduction and improved phytoremediation. We produce gold produces clean biofuels, low I look uh, with low I look risk by selected selected uh, lignocellulose crops on specific contaminated lands, and also promotes the international collaboration towards the Mission Innovation Challenge 4 on biofuels. Always uh, in the whole um, goal, we are working towards the sustainable development goals. Let's move to the next. Just to give an idea on one specific impact that we want to create win-win situation. And you can see here the combination of the contaminated lands, as I mentioned before, organic and inorganic pollutants, the, uh, the selected uh, energy crops, each partner has to grow at least three crops and the practices. And all of this combination, uh, in total 44, they are going to give us very valuable feedstock uh, about what can be expected when you grow ligno crops on specific contaminated lands and in, you can make projection in how many years we can clean uh, the fields. Let's go to the next, I'm almost done. Uh, it's fair to present the consortium. With the yellow, you can see the partners, but with blue, you can see the members of the international collaboration. I think, I, Mauricio, I'm always done. Uh, the next is the final slide, I think. Uh, I would like to thank the golden partners uh, that uh, helped me to write the proposal during the, um, the first pandemic crisis. Uh, and of course, I would like to thank you, Keresis and Fito to Climate for the excellent collaboration uh, uh, in order to prepare this very nice workshop. Thank you very much. Thank you, Effie. It's nine minutes and 30 seconds. So you were perfectly on time. <laughs> Thanks a lot. And I really also look forward to, uh, this is the start. This is the first time that we have a joint uh, event and a joint initiative with the other three projects. Uh, for sure, it will be not uh, the, uh, the only one. So I'm also looking forward just, to Mauricio, just to mention that next month, we're going to have finally our first physical meeting. We yeah. will visit one contaminated site close to Paris, and we're going to make finally a video of these areas and the first communication set of gold. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we the, this is the next uh, the next uh, challenge soon after the UBC. Thank you, Effie, also for announcing this. Uh, let me see if there is anything in the chat. I don't see. So, in the interest of time, also to keep time for the panel discussion after, and I hope to stimulate the discussion after. I would now move to the second speaker, Matteo Fermeglia uh, from Hasselt University of Belgium. Uh, he will introduce the second project, Fly to Climate, uh, Clean Biofuel Production and Phytoremediation Solutions from Contaminated Land Worldwide. Matteo, the floor is yours. Thanks a lot, Maurizio. Good afternoon, everybody. I hope you can see everything Please here. Please put in full mode. Yes, we'll do right away. Um, so first of all, again, I joined FT4 thanking uh, very much the other project teams. It's been a terrific collaboration uh, and I hope, I hope it will endure in the future, of course. This is just a starting point. I also have to thank FT quite a lot because she covered quite some ground as related to the main objectives of Fight to Climate, which uh, in several respects are pretty much, not I would say overlapping, not replicating what is being done in gold, but essentially purports uh, the same objectives. As the title would show, uh, Fight to Climate is mostly about squaring the circle even here uh, about two main issues in the EU. So the massive widespread of contaminated sites, uh, 2.5 million, again, uh, I just read a, an interesting report by the EEA about the increasing share of land take in Europe, which is a concern, of course, from an environmental and social perspective. And at the same time, of course, the issue of providing uh, sustainable fuels. Uh, so fight to climate is, of course, uh, just you have a, you have some general information here. Uh, it started in 2021. is run. It will run through 2025. Um, 4.1 uh, million euros funding, uh, research innovation action. Um, so aside, I mean numbers aside, uh, here is the main um, outline of the project, which again resembles quite a lot the other two projects with which we are partnering here. 
So essentially, uh, what we will be doing and what we are doing in phytoclimate is developing some, well, uh, especially phyto extraction techniques in some pilot sites uh, within and outside the EU. Uh, and then uh, essentially collect the output materials of this and turn it into uh, advanced biofuels, essentially uh, dropping biofuels for road and maritime uh, transport and likewise biocoke for metallurgical industry. So in this way, you will see the win-win situation we will be creating uh, about generating uh, biofuels on the one hand, at the same time remediating soil in a very sustainable manner. Um, again, we have a very well-versed uh, consortium uh, to do this. Here you have the general outlook of it. Uh, we have 16 partners coming from 11 countries. Uh, three countries are located outside the EU, as you can see in this, uh, in this map. Uh, one in Argentina, more particularly, one in India, and also one in Serbia. Uh, at, aside from the extra EU countries, of course, we have eight therefore member states, if I counted correctly, uh, that are involved uh, in this project from different perspectives. Uh, the pilot sites in relation to uh, the phyto uh, remediation techniques that are being rolled out in the work package too, this project are located in Spain, in Terrassa, where we will be heading in <clears throat> about one month for our first consortium meeting. So yeah, hefty, we're catching up. And, uh, and then we have one uh, pilot site located in Serbia, one located in Lithuania, uh, while located in Argentina and while located in India. So this is pretty much the upshot as relates to uh, the overall project approach. Again, um, I am not necessarily the best suited person to talk about technical aspects of this project because I am supposed to be a lawyer. Uh, what I can tell, however, is that indeed uh, one of the most innovative aspects of this project is uh, the use of TCR technique and the development of a biorefinery in Germany for this purpose to convert the, um, well, essentially the, the biomass that will be generated from the, for the phyto, phyto remediation techniques into advanced biofuels. And this will be run especially, uh, specifically from Fraunhofer Institute in Germany. So uh, this is essentially, again, an overview about the project. Um, I would like to give you some extra upshots about our work. I mean, the work of that who ASAT is doing from a legal and policy perspective, which perhaps would also inform the discussion later during the panel. Uh, this is the team from uh, Hasselt University. We have essentially three people involved. Marco Perisic is also in this virtual room here, who's a PhD uh, student at Hasselt University. I myself, assistant professor and postdoctoral assistant, and Bernardo Hursden, who's full professor of environmental law. So as you can see, we will probably not be too much down to phytoremediation techniques, not too much down to uh, biofuels conversion, but mostly skilled in environmental law. Uh, so this is exactly what I would like to give an overview about um, before, I'm sorry, after a general uh, bird's eye view on the structure of the project. Um, the structure of the project is composed by seven work packages. Uh, essentially, uh, as I mentioned, we have these pilots, uh, these phytoremediation pilots in five countries being uh, run under work package two, and which started in 2021. We are quite at the early stage there. Uh, of course, in terms of yielding the crops and selecting the right crops. Um, then, of course, we have, as I mentioned, the thermochemical conversion, which will take place in Germany, thanks to the work of Fraunhofer Institute. Uh, and then we have a quite, a quite important work, I think, uh, cross-cutting work being done under Work Package 4, related to the uh, social acceptance and the life cycle assessment, uh, let's say, analysis of this process. So we are very much combining the innovative uh, aspects and technical aspects of this project with environmental and social consideration, uh, which to my thinking is, is very much important. At the same time, we have, of course, also an exploitation strategy being run. We also having a workshop uh, earlier today about how to engage with business, with business models uh, in relation to the value chain addressed by the project. And last, we have work package six, which is our business here, who was business about the legal and regulatory aspects of the whole value chain covered by the project. Essentially in work package six, which is, as you can see in this graph cross-cutting, we will be addressing, and we have addressed so far uh, to some extent, uh, the most relevant legal and regulatory barriers that would arise down the road to a different, um, to different steps that we are covering this project down from 
uh, work package two to work package three, essentially. So from the selection of the crops and the yielding of the crops for the phyto phytoremediation techniques down to the conversion and the production of advanced biofuels. So here is work package six. Uh, we, uh, who also is coordinating work package six, as, as I mentioned, essentially uh, it aims to uh, identify regulatory issues and legal bottlenecks and perform a legal analysis thereof to explore what the needed changes in the policy and regulation, not only in the EU, would be in order to make it more conducive, to make the legal environment more conducive to the uptake of phytoremediation <clears throat> and the conversion in advance um, and the production of advanced biofuels. So, dropping biofuels, as I mentioned in the first place. We will also be mapping potential legal opportunities provided by the current legal framework. So essentially, if there is anything uh, that is already out there that can be conducive to this end, and I think uh, Maya Gorgiad already provided quite a picture of that to some extent. Um, and of course, identify best legal practices about vital remediation and recovery of materials. Um, so we will take stock of what is already out there in order to develop in the end, recommendations to different pointed stakeholders, including EU lawmakers and national lawmakers uh, about how to create a, a conducive, again, a proper environment to the uptake of phytoremediation. Um, in Work Packet 6, essentially what we have been doing so far is um, the mapping. So we essentially, we have started by mapping what are the relevant um, areas of law that might, be, uh, might require further analysis in order to identify the actual legal bottlenecks and the actual legal opportunities provided by the legal framework in all the legal systems that I pointed on the left-hand side uh, with a specific focus on the EU. Then what we, have, what we are doing right now is to uh, make the collection of these findings. So identify what are the most relevant roadblocks. And this probably would be the topic of the discussion in the panel. We will then do a proper legal analysis of these barriers and opportunities and eventually devise a policy output in terms of recommendations. Uh, in, a very, in the very last minute, because I see Maurizio is creeping on me in the, web, in the virtual screen, so I, I guess my time is almost One up. minute and a half. One minute and a half. One and a half minutes. It would no. be more than enough. It would be more than enough. So, <clears throat> so just to give you an upshot of what we have done so far, but Marco, my colleague, would be more pointed later. Um, well, what we have identified is a list of relevant legislation that actually stand out as providing potential barriers uh, down the line to the proper uptake of phytoremediation and conversion into advanced biofuels. And you can find it in this slide. So essentially, policies related to endocrine disruptor, uh, disruptors, invasive alien species, GMOs, of course, soil and water quality, the incoherence of soil, soil and water quality legislation, especially soil quality legislation in the EU is apparent, and we will be talking about that, I think, later. Uh, waste and chemicals legislation and bioenergy, more generally. There are, of course, some more specific barriers that we want to unfold later, but this is pretty much the size of it as far as our research is concerned under Work Package 6. Um, in doing this, again, we have tried to break this down the road of the specific value chain. So again, you can see that as we move from the site characterization, identification of crops for the phytoremediation techniques and all the way down to the end use of biofuels, the different legal areas that I listed in the previous slide pop up here and there. So you have GMOs, invasive alien species at the very beginning when you have to implement the actual, the actual phytoremediation, waste legislation, major barrier related to the management of byproducts in terms of conversion for advanced biofuels, and then all the way down to the storage and transport of this feedstock and uh, ultimately down to, down to the conversion. Of course, we have biofuels regulation, the sustainability criteria outstanding there, and probably that will be also a point of discussion later. And, light, and ultimately, indeed, policies related to a support to biofuels also as opposed to other sources, um, other fuels essentially, so fossil fuel based uh, fuels. So um, you see, this is a very snapshot of what we've been doing so far. Of course, I'm open to questions uh, at any time. And again, a big thank you to uh, to the organizer of the conference. Uh, great job so far. And uh, to all the teams in Golden Services for this workshop. Thank you. Thank you, Matteo. Thank you for this very nice presentation and also for keeping, keeping the timing as well. We actually do have two questions in the chat by Eleni Papazoglu from the Gold team. Uh, which contaminants are your sites contaminated with and which crops do you cultivate? I don't know if you already answered in your presentation, maybe I missed it. 
Otherwise, feel free to reply. And in the meantime, yeah. I see uh, Effie also had an, a question, but I think she, she already replied in the chat. Um, just quickly, I think I can answer to this question in the chat so I can be more precise. Uh, there are, well, there are mostly um, um, heavy metals in there. I can be more precise in writing uh, because I, I really don't want to misspell this here. So I, I can be more precise on okay. that. Okay, okay. And that's also useful. So to fit the timing and uh, the continuation of this part of the event now uh, involves the third the presentation of the third project. Uh, from Athanasios Rentizelas from the National Technical University of Athens. Uh, and he will talk about Cell Resist, the project Cell Resist, contaminated uh, land remediation through energy crops for soil improvement to liquid biofuel strategies. Thanos, the floor is Thank you, Mauricio. Uh, we cannot hear you very well. Can you hear me better now? Yes, yes, yes. and now? it's in full mode, you can go ahead. Okay, thank you. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Thanos Redizelas. I'm an assistant professor at the National Technical University of Athens, uh, and I'm the Ceresis project coordinator. I would like to thank uh, both organizers and the other projects, and also CIMEA for making this happen due to a clustering event they organized last uh, October. So this is where we uh, got in touch uh, the different projects. Um, the main name of the project of Ceresis is pretty much the same as the other projects, uh, unsurprisingly. Um, I, so I will focus more on the objectives of this particular project because we are adopting a, a slightly different approach in how to achieve the same aim. The first objective is to demonstrate the suitability and effectiveness of various uh, conventional and novel species of energy crops for phytoremediation in contaminated lands against a variety of both organic and inorganic contaminants. The second objective has to do with uh, demonstrating the potential of two thermochemical technologies uh, for producing biofuels from contaminated biomass. And these are supercritical water gasification and fast pyrolysis. And this also has to do with uh, developing and adapting uh, separation technologies for uh, separating uh, contaminants. And the third objective is where we diversify ourselves from, uh, from the previous two projects is that we're aiming to provide decision support to stakeholders and policymakers to achieve optimal win-win solutions for site-specific situations. So when they have a specific site that has contaminated land and they want to produce biofuel from that, uh, we're aiming to provide the specific uh, support to them so that they can make informed decisions. Um, our project started in November 2020 with a 42 months duration, and the budget is, uh, including the Canadian and Brazilian funding, is uh, over 4 million. And here I would like also to thank uh, both the European Union and PAPEC and New Frontiers in Research Fund from Canada for supporting this project. And this is a map of uh, the partners. You can see we have partners in uh, Canada, Brazil. Uh, the UK, Luxembourg, Germany, Italy, Greece, and the Ukraine. Uh, so it's eight countries and 12 partners overall. And this is uh, pretty much the structure of our project. Uh, it follows uh, very well the objectives of the project. So the top left is the phytoremediation pillar, where we run a series of trials uh, with energy crops and uh, uh, where we are investigating different types of contaminants, different climatic conditions and soil compositions. We are also looking at alternative and different phytoremediation strategies, as well as trying to optimize the planting and harvesting, for example, no tillage uh, practices. Um, so from this uh, pillar, we will take uh, uh, several samples of biomass that, that are sent to the technological pillar, which is at the bottom left. And here we optimize the two conversion processes to be used with contaminated biomass. And we are also developing and adapting the separation technologies to make this happen. Uh, from the trials of the technological pillar and also from the remediation pillar, we have a lot of data that will be fed into the decision support pillar, which is the right one. In this one, we are developing a decision support system 
to support end users or stakeholders in making decisions uh, when assessing scenarios for different pathways. And by pathways, we mean combinations of crops and harvest methods, conversion and separation technologies. We use several uh, techniques to achieve that, and we do several types of analysis within the decision support system. These include life cycle analysis, techno-economic analysis, as well as supply chain optimization. And by doing all that, ultimately, we are um, proposing optimal solutions in terms of uh, land restoration and biofuel production to the, the end users. On the side of this, we are also aiming to uh, have four use case applications that I will show just in the next slide. So we're going to apply the decision support system in four use cases. And from all this, we're also aiming to come up with policy recommendations uh, in the end of the project. Now, this slide shows the, uh, the areas where we are uh, having the use cases. The first use case is in the UK, in Scotland, uh, looking at non-agricultural land, which includes brownfield sites and former landfills and mining sites. So a large-scale application of the decision support model. Uh, in Italy, we're going to look at agricultural area that is contaminated with arsenic from use of uh, pesticides. In the Ukraine, we are looking at uh, heavy metals contamination at tailing sites from ilmenite sand mines. And in Brazil, we are looking at uh, large agricultural areas again, with uh, contaminated with chromium from tanneries waste that had been used uh, uh, as um, fertilizer. Um, this is uh, just a slide showing the value chain. Uh, I won't go into many details, but essentially what we want to show here is that the exploitable results are expected to cover the full value chain uh, of uh, biofuel production. So upstream, we will deliver uh, novel decontamination methods and novel energy crops for photoremediation. Uh, midstream, we're going to uh, have some exploitable results on technologies and technological pathways for treating contaminated biomass so that biofuel can be generated. And of course, the decision support system platform will cover the full value chain. And the same happens with the regulatory framework and policy recommendations. So these are the expected exploitable results. Now, uh, moving into some key findings, um, this is just a very short summary, and later on, uh, my colleague George will give more details, but the key findings up to now in terms of policy and regulatory issues are that soil protection and contaminated land management have not been subject to specific legislative instruments at EU level up to now. And we, there is no unified overarching legislative framework that would bring together um, the contaminated land management and the biofuel production. And this is, of course, a barrier for industrial involvement and, and progress in this field. Uh, on the other hand, uh, there is the new EU soil strategy and the provisions of the Fit for 55 package, uh, which could provide a boost in, uh, in this. And I will also give you a short uh, briefing on the progress up to now, since I think we are the first uh, project of the whole batch that, uh, that started. Um, in terms of energy crops and phytoremediation, our strategy in general would discuss to look at phytostabilization and also energy cropping using perennial grasses in particular. The focus has been uh, similarly, to, to gold if I remember correctly, on high biomass yield and low contaminant uptake energy crop species. The idea here is to maximize the production of biomass and with it the energy and biofuel production, uh, while at the same time maximizing offtake. And this is also beneficial for the economics, of course. And we, we are also utilizing biomass from a series of existing trial sites, pre-existing, um, at the same time as we are uh, also doing uh, field trials within the project. So we have older biomass and new biomass uh, trials. And this allowed us to start uh, the technology, technology experiments earlier, the processing experiments. Up to now, we have uh, 15 field or greenhouse uh, trials planted, and these are using soil from eight contaminated and brownfield sites uh, in all four areas, the UK, Italy, Ukraine, and Brazil. This includes lands in uh, formal metal mines, oil refineries, uh, landfills, shipyards and railway lands, and agricultural land that is uh, impacted by pesticides, 
spills of lubricating engine oils, which is organics, or tannery effluents. Uh, up to now, we have collected 19 bulk biomass samples from several field trials and 11 species in total in three of the countries. Unfortunately, in Ukraine, uh, we had issues with. Uh, we have collected uh, reed canary grass, miscanthus, willow, switchgrass, um, biomass from hazelnut and vineyard tree trimmings, uh, sugar cane, two types of sugar cane, and two types of uh, napier grass. And here are some photos of uh, biomass happily growing. At the top left is uh, uh, miscanthus in uh, former landfills in the UK. The bottom left is uh, napier grass uh, in chrome contaminated uh, agricultural land. It's not napier grass. The bottom right is uh, reed canary grass in, uh, in Italy, uh, contaminated with arsenic. And the, uh, the top right is uh, Ukraine, where we have uh, both reed canary grass and miscanthus in uh, lubricating oil contaminated uh, farm. In terms of progress uh, on the technological uh, side, we, we have, uh, in terms of this uh, supercritical water gasification, you can see here the process. We have identified the parameters and defined the process requirements. The, uh, the plant, the laboratory plant that we are using has been modified to treat uh, contaminated biomass and preliminary tests have been uh, done. There have been experiments on the membrane, ga membrane gas absorption technology uh, for uh, hydrogen sulfide and CO2 removal. We have set up uh, the electrocoagulation laboratory pilot. And downstream, we have optimized the process parameters and conditions for syngas reforming and fissure trop synthesis. In terms of the second uh, technological pillar, which is uh, fast pyrolysis, we have uh, identified again the parameters and defined the process requirements. The fast pyrolysis tests are already ongoing. We have uh, done mild combustion experiments with methane and surrogate biomass. And in terms of uh, separation, we have uh, done several microfiltration permeability tests with water, glycerol, and pyrolysis bio oil. And on top of this, uh, there's been a lot of modeling simulation work going on, of course, in terms of the technologies. We have developed a detailed kinetic mechanism for um, uh, supercritical water gasification of the key species and a one uh, dimensional dynamic model for pyrolysis. And we have developed process models for both uh, the technological pathways up to now. And this was my last slide. So thank you very much for your attention and happy to respond to any questions. Thank you, Thanos. And uh, also thanks uh, also to you for keeping the time. I don't see for the moment any questions for you, but uh, I remind and I invite the speakers to use the chat box in the virtual platform. And uh, I would go to the next presentation, but uh, if there are questions for you, we'll take them uh, after the, ne the next presentation and before the wrap up. Okay, so our next presentation is not about the projects, uh, but uh, it's about the EU soil strategy and soil observatory. And the speaker is Luca Montanarella from ECJRC. Luca, the floor is yours. Yes, thank you. Good afternoon to everybody. I will try to share my screen with a few slides, if you allow. Um, if it works. Is it working? Yes, just put it in full mode. OK. Do you see it? Fine, fine. I, I will be very quick because I don't want to take too much of your time. You have enough time. As you don't say, worry. I work at the European Commission, um, but I work in a service of the Commission, which is uh, the technical science service of the Commission uh, in-house. Our job is to give support to our colleagues developing and implementing policies uh, on, in all areas of work of the Commission. Specifically, my job and the, the team that I'm leading here at the GRC is to support the soil related policies within the EU, particularly, of course, the upcoming soil strategy and the future soil health law. Uh, I would like to mention that I make this presentation very quickly, also because uh, there is with us here, my colleague from DG Environment, who is the leading service in developing the soil strategy, uh, which is Mirko Barbero. So uh, I'm sure that he can come back to you 
with further details. And I will just briefly mention a few highlights of what is going on and also a little bit tell you about what we're doing here in GRC, specifically on the, sol, uh, on the EU Sol Observatory. Now, uh, uh, we don't start from scratch. I suppose you are aware that the Commission already made an attempt uh, in the early uh, time of this century, so in actually starting in 2002, uh, uh, with a package that was presented to the Parliament and the, and the Council in 2006, which was uh, known as the EU Soil Thematic Strategy, which consisted also of a uh, proposal uh, by the Commission for a Soil Framework Directive. I don't want to bother you with the history of how all this went, but maybe you know that um, following a very difficult discussion in Council with a blocking minority of five member states, uh, at the end, in 2014, the Commission decided to withdraw the legislative proposal for a EU Soil Framework Directive. So there was a gap from 2014 till now, and, 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 and what changed was that uh, within the uh, new Commission from the Lion, uh, we have a vision, which is the European Green Deal, which includes several strategies and several uh, packages that are quite relevant to what we're doing on soils in the Commission. Uh, our soils is a cross-cutting issue, so our soil, uh, soils are relevant to many policy areas in the EU. Uh, and within the Green Deal, of course, the core, one of the core business uh, units or activities is, of course, the climate change ambition, the uh, ambition to be climate neutral for the European Union. And of course, soils play a key role because, as you know, soils are a major sink, actually the second largest sink on the planet after the ocean. So it's a major sink that has quite a relevant role to play in mitigating and adapting to climate change. Uh, the second area of the European Green Deal where soils are pretty relevant and maybe relevant also to the topic of this meeting is that we have the ambition to uh, achieve a zero pollution and toxic free environment for the European Union. Uh, the, we have a zero pollution strategy in place. Uh, uh, we have uh, a vision in place to achieve this ambitious goal. And of course, soils again play a major role because as you already mentioned in several presentations I was just following before, uh, there is quite a heritage in the EU about uh, contamination, soil contamination. Uh, I will come back to that later on. Uh, you were mentioning frequently a number of 2.5 million contaminated sites. I would like to stress that this is just an estimate of the amount of contaminated sites, and I will come back to the actual data later. Um, there is, of course, also the ambition to preserve and restore ecosystems and biodiversity. So the EU, soil, but the EU Biodiversity Strategy 2030 is the place where the embedded is also the vision for uh, the soil um, strategy that we will talk a little bit more in detail. Uh, and, and, and of course, this is another important part of what we're doing on soils. There is much more soil biodiversity below ground, much more biodiversity often below ground and above ground. A lot of the soil biodiversity is little known. And so there is a lot of work to be done also in the research area on understanding better what is the uh, amount and the functioning of the biome below ground. Another important cross area of the Green Deal is of course the circular economy and the fact that soils play a key role uh, in the circular economy and the circularity of production and consumption. Uh, it's also related to what I hear in these projects, and of course the fact that soils are ultimately very often the receptor of the final uh, products uh, as a waste disposal site, unfortunately, uh, going into the circularity uh, would allow to, to, to remediate many, many contaminated areas. But there is also circularity for many other things, for example, very important, the circularity for biomass, so the, the vision to increase soil organic carbon, soil organic matter, by bringing back uh, organic carbon and organic matter coming from waste, particularly all the issue about bio waste and about composting. And so here there's again, quite an important uh, role for soils to play. Uh, obviously, uh, soils are also key to having healthy food and healthy food is the core uh, topic of the farm to fork strategy. Uh, healthy soils produce healthy food for healthy people. So I think that's pretty obvious. Uh, given the uh, extent of contaminated areas, given the extent of diffuse soil pollution, of course, this is an issue that is linked also with achieving a zero pollution environment. 
and we can come back to that if you want in the discussion. Ultimately, let's not forget that the EU is a leading organization globally, and also on soils, we have quite some leadership globally. Uh, we are one of the founding members of the Global Soil Partnership, and we have been investing quite a lot in the last years in promoting, not only in the EU, but globally, the awareness that soils need to be protected for sustainable development. Now, now to the actual strategy, as I said, I don't think we have time here to go into all details, but I want to insist on the fact that it's a cross-cutting issue. So the EU soil strategy is touching upon many of other legislative uh, packages and, 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 and strategies that are brought together into a common vision, which is the vision to achieve healthy soils uh, by 2050. So that's the vision of the entire soil strategy. Now here comes a lot of uh, issues that still are in discussions, how to achieve this vision, how to implement the strategy, um, what do we mean by healthy soils? So a lot of questions that are still in debate. As you know, we have a very large research effort going on on soils, uh, not only uh, by projects that are already ongoing from the previous work, uh, framework program, but of course, all the new uh, possibilities for doing top, top research in the EU through the mission uh, on soils, the Soil D for Europe, you may have heard about this. And of course, the mission has a key role to play in helping us in understanding better what we intend by healthy soils and how we want to achieve the vision outlined in the strategy. Um, now, to the end then, quickly what we are doing here in the Joint Research Center, as I said, our role is to underpin what we do on soils with actual facts and data. We want to base our policies on, on data, on actual measured parameters, so that we are not basing it on impressions and on, on, on fake news, if I can call them like this, but on real actual data that are scientifically sound and can be uh, used also for uh, objective assessment of the status of soils in the EU. We don't start from scratch also here because we have since more than 20 years uh, operating the European Soil Data Center, which you're more than have, welcome to, to, to visit, where you can download all the data, all the information on all issues related on soils in the EU and also beyond the EU. And most data, as I said, are also freely available and you're more than happy to download the available data for your use. Uh, but the observatory that was just launched one year ago will expand this work of the European Soil Data Center with uh, several uh, elements that are going to be uh, implemented uh, during the uh, next years. First of all, of course, we will further develop our EU-wide soil monitoring capacity, and I will come back to that. Secondly, we want to translate the data that we get from our soil monitoring activities into actual indicators that can be used to monitor actual policy implementation. Uh, we want to continue to support research activities with data and information. And finally, we want to have a shared approach with stakeholders and major actors. So coming to the end, um, quickly, what is soil monitoring? Where do we get the data from, uh, for, from on, on, to take our decisions? Our current soil monitoring system is based on a regular grid all over Europe at two by two kilometer spacing, which is called Lucas. Uh, which makes 1 million and 100,000 points roughly. Out of these points, we have a stratification exercise that allows us then to uh, select a number of points that are relevant. And on these points, we regularly go and take soil samples and allow us to have an objective picture of what's going on by directly sampling and measuring several parameters. This system will be expanded, also incorporating the national soil monitoring systems in the near future. Just a few examples of what you get out of this. Measuring means that you get measurements at points. Relevant maybe for your work are the measurements related to contamination. Particularly, we are measuring regularly uh, heavy metals, but also other contaminants which are emerging and are relevant to several uh, EU policy areas. Uh, of course, these are point measurements. Then out of the point measurements through spatial interpolation techniques, we produce maps. Here are a few examples, and maybe relevant to your work is the map you see there at the bottom. bottom One bottom minute. The left. Yes, I'm nearly finished. Bottom on the left is the copper distribution in European soils, uh, very much co correlated with uh, uh, wine production areas, obviously being copper, one of the oldest used uh, fungicides uh, in, in those areas. 
And of course, all these uh, get translated into a, a dashboard of indicators that will allow us then to monitor implementation of various policies. I, I, I just uh, close saying that all this is open to everybody. We have an open forum that we convene a regular uh, schedules where everybody is more than welcome to participate. The first meeting was just last October. We are scheduling the next meeting this summer with dedicated working groups of various stakeholders and uh, active, active groups and, and interested groups that are working together with us in the various topics that are relevant to the work we are currently doing. So finally, uh, concluding, uh, the vision will be implemented through a coherence between different elements, a long-term reservoir, soil data and information, which is the EU Soil Observatory, a policy framework, which my colleague Mirko can tell you more, uh, which is the soil strategy, and a funding and coordination mechanism, which is crucial in order to have the necessary funding to implement the vision, which is the soil health and food mission, also known as the soil deal for Europe. It's all online and you're more than welcome to, to, to read the full details. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Luca, for this uh, very detailed overview. Uh, it was a very dense hour of uh, an hour of dense of uh, information in the past uh, six, uh, five presentations. Uh, let me see if I see any questions uh, for the last two presentations in the chat. No, uh, but we're still in time to take them in the chat uh, or later after the discussion. I'd like now to invite my colleague Emma to help us wrap up the common aspects and the highlights of this part, this first part before we introduce the panel discussion. Thanks, Maurizio. Yeah. Well, I just want to say thank you very much for all those um, really interesting presentations. And um, so my take home messages from this is that, um, of course, soils are incredibly important not only for us to live on as humans, but they are a sink for carbon dioxide and also a resource for life, for our food, for our buildings, for us to live on. Um, it's clear that there is a lot of barriers in terms of policies at the moment that um, Luca is working towards breaking them down. But I'd like to say that our, these three projects here that we're working with, um, Gold, Ceresis and Fighty Climate, are all key um, what can we say? <laughs> they hold a wealth of information, research information that can also include in the, the soil strategies to breaking down the barriers, barriers within policies. And not only are our projects looking to for another sustainable source for biofuels, which is an, which would be grown on low risk ILAC um, sites, but at the end of producing the biofuels, we can also reuse the soil. So it will then become more, of, more areas for use for us to build on, well, not to build on, to use for, for, for food and use as safe places, as well as creating more natural habitats for animals and um, carbon dioxide sinks. So uh, to, just to, to sum up, um, these three, I see these three projects as key pathways in bridging the gap between creating new sustainable energies and also creating or recreating usable land for the future. Thank you. Thank you, Emma. Right. Uh, thanks a lot. Okay. So uh, it's nice to see that the number of attendees is steady, which is, means that uh, the conversation and the topics are interesting. It's now time to, uh, to move on to the second part of this event and the final part of this event, which is the panel discussion. And for this, I hand over the chair to and the moderation to Matteo Fermelia, which I have already listened to, and he will introduce our panelists. Matteo, the floor is yours. Thanks a lot, Maurizio, again. Uh, very happy to change my head from one side to another uh, and to take over for this second session, which I hope will be quite insightful. I do wish we can have a very fruitful conversation. Um, I think uh, Luca Montanarella already dropped some issues on the table that uh, will be discussed. Um, my, my take for this, for this 
panel session would be to be as interactive as possible. And therefore, I would rather uh, steer it as a roundtable discussion. In fact, what I would like to have first, uh, as I instructed all the people present in this panel, uh, in this virtual room, is to have first a, a quick round of uh, maximum five minutes um, about the main takes that will be derived from the project so far. Um, as it was, I think, uh, quite displayed in the first session, all three projects touch somehow upon regulatory and policy aspects related to fight remediation and uh, advanced biofuel production. So I would like to hear from the three uh, persons actually uh, representing the three, con the three consultia here. So Marco Perisic, who is again uh, post a PhD at, at uh, Hasselt University, Eftimia uh, Alexopoulos, Alexopoulos, pardon, uh, from the uh, gold team and Jorge Valiotakis, Valiotakis, sorry, I'm terrible at pronunciations here, uh, from the services team. Uh, in briefly five minutes, I will start with Marco here um, to answer a very basic question. So essentially, what are the main policy gaps and blind spots that you would like to underscore in light of the findings of your project so far? Hmm? And also a follow-up question, whether the EU policy and regulatory framework currently in place is conducive and supportive to square this circle uh, between the need to remediate contaminated soils and foster advanced biofuel production. I will just give you five minutes each. Uh, I have my red card as a true Italian, of course. I want to, I want to be a football spin to it, so I don't know if you see it, but uh, there's a one minute warning. So please, uh, Marco Paisi, first you have the floor. Thank you, Matteo, so much. Um, well, uh, first, I must say that uh, I'm very uh, honorable that to be present here uh, as a speaker of uh, uh, our project, Matteo. Uh, our findings uh, relies on uh, both international and EU law. Uh, the main barriers and issues highlighted uh, so far by Phyto Climate are both uh, general and specific. Um, the general issues are the lack of comprehensive legislation on soil remediation, then uh, the lack of uh, regulatory initiatives for using uh, natural uh, based soil remediation techniques, and uh, dedicated policy uh, support for advanced biofuels production. Uh, the specific uh, policy gaps uh, and barriers that uh, may influence uh, the, the projects are in the following areas. Uh, first, a legislation on invasive species, for example, limitation or a ban on choosing certain species, um, both national or in the European Union, uh, there are um, lists of uh, invasive species, then uh, genetically modified organisms, um, and new genomic techniques, also limitation or, or ban of using for uh, phytoremediation. Um, classification of phytoremediation uh, as an agricultural uh, activity. Uh, then uh, waste legislation, especially uh, with regards uh, to the distinction between byproducts uh, and the phase status. Um, the same, the same thing is also with the shipment of the waste. Uh, the, the problems are actually uh, the traceability of uh, byproducts, or when the um, uh, some product uh, chase to be waste. Uh, then we have um, chemical uh, legislation. Um, it's advice on the authorization or even restriction of certain substances, uh, and with regards to the. Um, uh, <clears throat> uh, biofuels, uh, there is a lack of comprehensive certification for non-food crops and advanced biofuels, and a lack of coordinated policy support for advanced biofuels like uh, some initiatives, schemes, or uh, even quota obligation. Uh, may I now pass to the second question, Matteo? Is it okay? Yes, you can. Yeah, uh, thank you. Um, well, uh, I, I would like to say that, um, yeah, only in part. In this case, um, almost every policy uh, related to fight remediation and the recovery of output materials has uh, advantages and uh, weaknesses or limitation, if you want. Uh, but however, uh, we have on one hand um, 
necessity of uh, remediation of contaminated sites. And on the other, um, we have to find solution for uh, contaminated biomass in order to uh, produce advanced biofuels. However, I will try to provide an answer uh, on, a, on the example of one of the drivers uh, that should bridge uh, the gap between uh, fight remediation and vast biofuels, and that is Renewable uh, Energy Directive. Um, well, uh, first of all, the definition of biomass uh, included in the Renewable Energy Directive refers to biodegradable fractions of uh, products, waste, re and residues, but of biological origin from agriculture, fisheries, uh, forestry, and so on. This definition cannot be applied to all phytoremediation techniques. Uh, for example, biomass obtained by the phytoextraction, by the accumulation of heavy metals in harvested uh, parts of the plants, uh, cannot fall under this definition, since the heavy metals are not biodegradable. And uh, that further implies that contaminated land biomass must uh, fall under waste legislation. Which, is, which, which may be a problem. And I'm finishing. Um, finally, fight remediation deals mostly with the contaminated land instead of agricultural land. Thank you for uh, your attention and I, I wish you a good day and enjoyable panel session. Thanks a lot, Marco. Um, this is, of course, some, some job that we have been done uh, together at World Package 6, as I tried to, to, to explain earlier. Uh, but thanks for keeping the time. But I think we'll have time to also to deep dive into specific issues. Uh, and of course, feel free to drop questions in the chat at any time. Uh, I hope we can have some, I mean, we have some time for Q&A afterwards. So uh, without further ado, I will then turn to the second uh, project involved here. So again, uh, it's going to be a goal this time. So it's going to be Eftimia, please. The floor is yours on the same questions. Thank you, Matteo. In order not to repeat what Marco presented earlier, I would like to say I would like to express my experience when I tried to write the gold proposal uh, two years ago. Uh, if we go two years ago, we can see that the soil mission, what it was presented by Luca, it was not so active. Uh, the last two years, we have a lot of uh, important information coming from this soil mission about new proposal, new initiatives. But if we go back, we can see when I tried to write the proposal, I just mentioned 2.5 million, uh, million contaminated sites. That is just an indication because this is the data that is available. To me, the most important thing is the missing of accurate data on contaminated sites in Europe. This is number one. And all of these projects, what are they doing? They do case studies. So each of us, we selected some specific case studies in Europe or worldwide. It's impossible to make general conclusions that cover everything. Each project is unique, although they funded by the same call, I saw that they are complementary because each project follow a different action. For instance, Fito to Climate has put a lot of references on the policy. On regulatory issues, not in, this is not the case of gold where we try just to develop win-win solution. Of course, policy is a number one issue, but how we're going to do policies and to find the black areas if we don't know which are the contaminated sites. Uh, actually, can we have a map that they present us, this is the contaminated site. In most of the case, they are typical agricultural areas that the people used to grow to produce food crops. And we don't, we don't say that, we keep it secret. For me, policy, it's okay, it's there, but first of all, number one priority is what the soil mission do that, to make clear, to have an atlas, a map, like a Lucas, detailed data everywhere and each country to take measurements on the, on the contaminated sites. This is the most important. And all of these projects, they are good. They are case studies to uh, make validation to the models and to prove that if some uh, data are true or not and to make some assumptions. This is from my side. Thanks a lot, FT, also for being quite ahead of time. Uh, and I think it complements uh, quite a lot what has been said already. We need policies, but we also need 
the with discovery tools, right? Where we need empirical findings that actually will inf inform even better the development of policies. So I, I do see this point. Then go okay, your turn. The screen is yours. Same questions. So thank you, Matteo. Uh, good evening to, to everyone. So I'm very happy to, to represent the CEDEX Consortium on this, on this discussion. I have to tell you that uh, this, uh, I mean, the main conclusions that uh, we have so far, of course, are, are not mine. We're working uh, together with uh, with my colleagues here at Excelsior, also at the Cochrane Foundation, and we also have a very good collaboration with the National Technical University of Athens and also the site uh, managers in the case studies uh, that we have in the project at Tuske University, Stadtklad University, UFG in Brazil, uh, and uh, also the, in Ukraine we have the Renewable Energy Agency. So our, our view on policy on Ceresis is somehow is, is slightly different from, from the other two projects because our main aim is to, to develop a decision support tool to create a win-win solution, as we call it, for, for the uptake of, of remediated biomass to, uh, to, the, to create uh, advanced uh, biofuels. So we're trying to see if there is an umbrella uh, policy or if the specific policies in place in, 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 the, in both ends could be combined under an umbrella that could facilitate the, the bridge and the link between these two areas. And uh, well, it's clear that uh, we need uh, the demand for, for, for advanced biofuels in particular is, is, is growing. Uh, you have, of course, Red 2 as the main driver where there is a clear bonus of something like 29 grams per megajoule if you have uh, degraded biomass from degraded land. But as Effie also mentioned before, there is, um, there is a gap of what is uh, degraded, what is contaminated. Uh, and this creates some, um, some confusion, for example, to, um, on how one can, can uptake uh, the biomass that comes from, from contaminated uh, sites. So from, from the point of view of biofuels, you have the need to, to acquire more biomass. Then you have some areas that are contaminated. We don't know where these are or how, how many uh, the, the, the area of this um, the, uh, of the, the, the amount of these areas, uh, but you could mobilize that biomass. The problem is that um, actually you don't have all the uh, the information in a standardized way in order to be able to to to, to go there and, uh, and and do the work. So you have um, so far we have found that uh, there is a lack of uh, of for, for risk assessment, uh, let's say definition for this type of lacks uh, of, of plants. Uh, so we need uh, better mapping on this. And uh, again, we also look at specific case studies because we want to, to see also um, how uh, the overall policy framework. Uh, is going down at the local level. So we, 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 we try to see, w because there are policies for the uh, decontamination of, of land in specific areas, but uh, these policies mostly have to do with local specificities. And this is perfectly fine, they can create a driver locally, but uh, although it's very difficult to generalize, as, as also Mark McTeffy just said, uh, it would be good to see if there is any consistency at, at the higher level, because that would create the enabling conditions for, for someone to invest uh, in, in this kind of, of value chain, uh, value chains that eventually would, um, would deliver a product that is tradable, if we're talking about uh, advanced biofuels. Uh, so yes, so we are uh, we're looking under this but more, let's say, uh, overarching perspective on, on the policy. And uh, as the project continues, uh, I hope we'll also have, uh, uh, we maintain the collaboration with, with uh, Free to Climate and, and Gold. And yeah, let's see where this can go. Thank you. Thank you, okay. I do hope, of course, and I do think share the, the thoughts here that uh, this collaboration will take, take us very far. Um, I do believe that all the policy outputs that are being delivered by the three projects are interested for, of course, the distinguished speakers that we have here. And um, I, I do believe that, as Georg mentioned, this should only be the start of a cooperation that would be uh, strengthening over, over time. We have quite some years ahead, uh, so we have quite some time to deliver uh, something that is meaningful, although more generally the time is running out, as IPCC, I think, made very clear. 
So um, with this, I thank uh, all three of you, uh, Marco, FT, and George, for your overview. I will then turn to the to our uh, invited speakers, uh, who again uh, are uh, Luca Montanareda, again say, you know, senior expert, Joint Research Center European Commission, and uh, Mirko Barbero, policy officer uh, in relation to soil protection and sustainable land use at DG Environment. So. I think we could not possibly find two persons that are better versed to discuss this, uh, to go into the details of this and give us your uh, their take huh? uh, on the issues that have been already, I hoped, uh, put on the tables here and there, uh, more from a general or even for a more detailed uh, perspective. I have uh, around a couple of rounds of questions with an asterisk uh, relation to the original pro uh, program. Unfortunately, we are not uh, having uh, Kadio Pepanotsu today. Uh, unfortunately, she had to uh, she had to uh, turn down our 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 proposal for for joining because of a last minute commitment. I will probably, if I, we have time, uh, drop some uh, points that she made, even in writing, uh, that might hopefully will spark some further discussion. Uh, this is, of course, a true pity, but commitments are commitments. So I will then turn to Luca right away um, with the first question to him, uh, which will basically be uh, related to uh, biomass. And the question would be, again, in five minutes, with the red card pending, um, what is the potential uptake of biomass from contaminated lands uh, with regard to biorefineries and uh, the industry? Uh, and what are the main drivers, in your view, uh, determining, determining the potential of uh, the uptake of biomass from contaminated lands, and therefore, the role that the regulatory framework could play in this respect. So thanks, Luca, five minutes from, from now. Not an easy question, but I can only start from where it all starts. And, and this is the issue of contaminated soil or contaminated land. So uh, as you said already several times, um, the key question is how to um, uh, have a clear definition of what we intend by a contaminated site, which is the first problem. And I, I recall, because I was involved in the early discussions of the Renewable Energy Directive, you made some reference to it. We had similar discussions at that time about what, what, what we intended by degraded land. So uh, I, I think this is a recurring discussion and we need to come to a common definition. The main difficulty there is that you may know that by now, at least in our part of the world, uh, soil contamination is nearly ubiquitous. So we have through atmospheric deposition, through a number of uh, anthropogenic uh, sources, nearly everywhere we will find some background of some contaminant. So now the key question is to set some thresholds to define together what would you define as a contaminated land in order then to start the entire process that you have been uh, elucidating in these research projects. Uh, so I see there the, the main difficulty. Uh, on the other hand, nature-based solutions, if we want to consider these nature-based solutions, have a huge potential because this is, this is exactly what we are trying to promote. So restoring degraded land uh, through phytoremediation, for example, uh, would be great. Uh, the, the, the other big question that is still open in my view is restoring means removing contamination removing contamination uh, should not mean displacing contamination somewhere else. So if uh, the phytoremediation means um, displacing the contamination somewhere else, then it's not really probably the solution. If the, the phytoremediation means really restoring the land uh, in a more, uh, let's say, functional way, because at the very end, what we want to achieve is to have land back to delivering the ecosystem services that we have uh, had originally. That's the definition of where we are going with the soil health law. Uh, so we, we want to be uh, uh, sure that these contaminants don't end up somewhere else. So uh, uh, I heard that there are several techniques. I mean, the fetal degradation, fetal remediation. I'm not an expert in the field, so I cannot tell you, but you can tell me much more. But I, I want to insist that being a soil scientist myself, that I see the main issue still on the table, the, the, the shared definition of what we intend by contaminated land. Uh, I, I can tell you, you talk very often of this uh, estimate of two and a half millions of contaminated sites. We still don't have a shared definition with our member states of what we intend by contaminated sites. So 
uh, it, it's a little bit uh, still all to be defined. And actually that's the huge work in front of us and Mirko can tell you much more uh, with member states in, in having uh, uh, legislation at EU level that will allow us to have these common definitions, to have this common approach, to have uh, an approach that can be then implemented together and possibly if it or remediation is certainly uh, uh, the way to go. Uh, I repeat, if we can then translate this into real action uh, at the EU level. Thanks a lot, Luca. Still ahead of time. Um, I do agree with several points you made. I'm taking also, of course. You know, lawyers need proper words, and I think you have dropped quite some on the table. Uh, definitions. We 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 are fond of definitions, and I do agree that uh, as far as soil protection is concerned, we do we do need more coordinated efforts in this respect at the EU level. But I think this is precisely what is being under it is under consideration at the European Commission level. So here comes. Um, well, it comes a question to Mirko Barbero, our, sec our second distinguished speaker. And the question would be essentially, what are the prospects from, from your side for, again, natural-based solutions under the new ongoing soil health law? Mm -hmm. uh, and if there are any specific insights you would like to share with us on this process, which is, again, ongoing, and what are the main difficulties, therefore, that you would see in developing such an harmonized legislation in the EU, uh, again, after the failure of the first soy framework directive back in 2014. So thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much for, for the question. Um, I would like first also to link with what uh, Lucas just said. Indeed, the uh, contaminated sites, so the obligation for member states to identif identify and remediate them was probably one of the reasons of the failure of the, of the past, because uh, member states, they know uh, the enormous costs that could be linked with the remediation of uh, contaminated sites. So if, we, um, if research is able to bring to member states a solution that is uh, uh, low cost, um, this uh, vicious circle could be uh, could be broken, but uh, for sure the policy questions are very, very, uh, very basic there. Eh? How much does it cost? How much time uh, is needed? Uh, uh, to um, towards which level uh, is de decreased the, the concentration? Um, for what concerns the the soil strategy, the soil strategy clearly said. Uh, we want to achieve uh, healthy soils, and one uh, flagship initiative will be the soil health law. Uh, mm, the soil health law, so with the aim of uh, achieving healthy soils by 2050, including remediation of contaminated sites, so that will be one aspect that will be uh, uh, addressed there. Obviously, uh, we have to take into account that uh, the uh, the competence uh, concerning uh, environmental protection is shared between the EU and member states. So the upcoming soil health law will not be uh, able to be too much prescriptive towards member states. So um, nature best solution obviously could be uh, of uh, inspiration for uh, develop uh, sustainable soil management practices, uh, like I mean, for example, soil biodiversity uh, is a, a nature-based solution that can be used to uh, store carbon, to combat uh, uh, pests, and also to uh, remediate uh, com contamination in, in some cases. But um, we could expect that we, we set the binding target for member states, and then we have to leave flexibility to member states to, to adapt to uh, specific conditions. So. Um, that's uh, subsidiarity, and which means that, uh, as I said, we will not be able to be uh, too much prescriptive on them to oblige them to use uh, specified the nature-based solutions in uh, in a given case or not. So this will be left uh, probably uh, for member states. But okay, that could be a guidance then to help member states to choose uh, the best solutions available. Um, uh, according to the latest uh, knowledge uh, that could be uh, uh, for sure uh, a way forward. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot for that. Thanks for sharing these, these insights with us. Uh, again, I do see the points related to subsidiarity. Uh, this is quite a legal matter that has to be addressed, I think, as soil health law will move forward. And uh, of course, if any other speaker in this panel wishes to 
raise a question uh, or spark a discussion, feel free to raise your virtual hand. Uh, uh, and of course, I'm taking also eventual questions in the chat. Um, a quick communication, I have just been informed that uh, Poppy's written answers are also being uploaded in the files tab uh, next to the chat. So this is available for everyone. I uh, can take a look. Uh, but now I see some actual ends. So Georgia, please. Yeah, thank you, Matteo. I just wanted to, to, to follow up on, on what Mr. Barbero just said that, of course, it, it, is, it is a big problem that the costs to, to, to clean lands, it's, it's, it's excessive. But, uh, and uh, what also we're trying to, to see in, in Ceres is that uh, whether, for example, the, uh, the premium that the advanced biofuels market brings, if this could be uh, an incentive good enough for someone to go uh, backwards in the value chain and see uh, if can take advantage of this premium and, and, and invest something to 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 clean up some uh, contaminated uh, land. Uh, I don't know if you have any any particular view on this or uh, uh, how how could these different worlds could be could be linked. It seems like there is some some supply some demand but they cannot meet. Thanks, Georg. Fair point. Who wishes to take on that? Mirko? I mean, it's a general question. I mean, yeah, yeah. I, can, I, can, I can react to that. So, uh, in order to prepare the, the law, indeed, uh, uh, we need to develop options. And then those options have, have to be impact assessed. Impact assessed means that uh, we are looking at costs and benefits of each of the options. Uh, including everything, including uh, premium, possible premiums for it, for example. So uh, this will have to be taken into account uh, in the in the analysis. Uh, so it's part of uh, of, of uh, what will be considered for sure. So, yes. yes, Mirko, any further reaction on this? I think this discussion happened already at the time of the Renewable Energy Directive, if I recall well. Uh, I think there was a discussion for a premium or a bonus. So, uh, but I think the uptake of this technology should be also a little bit market driven. So the question is also uh, to which extent is this really sufficient, the driver from the market? Or, or or not. And as Mirko says, this will be assessed through a, a, an impact assessment that looks at the various options. Um, but as a technology phytoremediation, given that it also allows to produce biofuel, um, should have by itself some, some, some economic uh, uh, return. So I don't know if in your projects you have any type of this type of analysis of the economics, or let's say the entire economic um, aspects of that technology. Uh, I think one of the project was mentioning social and economic uh, aspects. Uh, sorry if I didn't read the, yeah, probably you. So, it's us, it's uh, us. But, uh, yeah. Because at the very end, you know, we as the commission, uh, we rely very much on the output of research projects to, to, to have that type of guidance. So if you have done an economic analysis, that would be great for us to, 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 to take it on board. Thanks a lot, Luca. Me, FD. May yes. I say something? Uh, in gold also we are doing a, a socioeconomic analysis but keep in mind all the projects are case studies uh, uh, i know the socioeconomic analysis it's very easy to say i have this i have but it's very difficult to put something in the real world because they, they, we have case studies again specific uh, uh, sites contaminated specific crops assumptions model and finally socioeconomic sustainability etc but from this stage to go to the real market when the three projects are researched it's another world it's a big road to to, to go and keep in mind another issue all this project written two years ago in the beginning of covid crisis then we didn't know what the covid crisis would bring to our life because of the logistics supply that now is getting worse and worse, the food crisis and the energy crisis. And imagine now to go to our farmers and explain that we have to mapping in detail the maps to see if are they contaminated and, and if they are contaminated, you cannot cultivate. Now we are, that we are have great food crisis. 
we don't have Ukraine anymore. What is going to happen with, uh, uh, with commodities that they have to force other uh, to, to grow in other places? So uh, after uh, the, the last six months change again, I have to repeat to say that our lives rapidly and still we haven't seen the whole plan. So we don't, what is missing? We don't have the mapping of the contaminated lands. This project area, so all okay, assumptions, model, they are fine, they are good, they are studies, but it's not the real work. Thanks, Epti, for this. Um, I, I, I do agree that, of course, to, to take the leap from models and assumptions to real market taking off is, is a, it's, it's quite, a big, quite a big problem. And, um, and, but I see uh, this is also perhaps a, a point that comes out of our preliminary research, if I to climb it, that there are ways in which legislation can prompt some market-driven initiative uh, in order to connect um, nature-based solutions and biomass. And we will be exp exploring that further, of course, with a degree of universalization, because these you cannot uh, avoid in any, at any rate. But I think there is room there. Uh, to consider options that are viable from the market perspective. Uh, I see Maurizio has um, as an, an, a virtual end raised. Yes, thank you. Yeah, just to add uh, to what uh, Luca was just saying before, I fully agree that uh, mm, this mm, premium from advanced biofuels should come from market, should be market driven in some way. And it's true. I think we should also consider here in this specific case that we are talking about growing uh, producing advanced biofuels from contaminated land. And as Effie was saying, we don't even have a mapping of this. There are constraints, specific constraints probably related to this, not only related to the fertility of these soils, maybe also to the fact that these lands could be scattered and the mechanization aspects of this uh, probably this is, this is something that should be taken into account when looking at the uh, cost competitiveness of these uh, specific advanced biofuels. And the last point is probably there's also, I don't know, but maybe the also the upcoming carbon farming scheme could be seen as a, as a way to uh, add premium to this. To, to all these um, tools should be combined together with a, a coherent regulatory uh, framework that allows these uh, tools to deliver on what they, what they what we need. That's all. Thanks a lot for this, Maurizio. Any reactions to this? Um, the thing that comes to my mind while listening is that actually I'm afraid that we are facing exactly uh, the opposite situation. So as was mentioned, given the recent uh, events, there is a huge pressure to bring new land under uh, production, I mean, agricultural production. And so given the fact that, as I said before, we have not a clear vision of where this contaminated land is, um, I would not be surprised, and this is the risk also that we should be considering, that maybe we are growing crops on contaminated land, but not for biofuel. So this is a much more serious issue, I would say, uh, simply because it's linked to, 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 to health and, 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 and the food chain. So um, I'm, I'm really, uh, I really think the very first step, as I said already before, is to have a very clear, detailed assessment of contamination in the EU, in the sense to know where we have land or soils which are contaminated. And of course, you need to fix a threshold for what you consider contamination, and this is linked also to the human health. So uh, obviously, it will vary for the different contaminants. But but that's that's I think what is currently happening that the pressure to to bring under cultivation land that previously was not under cultivation due to the market pressure right now um, is is the risk that we are facing. So uh, I would, uh, that was coming to my mind also from some of the previous interventions. Uh, so uh, I think it's, it's 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 something to be considered. But of course, on these lands we should not grow uh, food staple uh, uh, food products, but much more biomass for other uses. Biofood is one of them, of course. Thanks. Thanks to, that, to everybody. I think we are getting a lot of insights here. Um, and by the way, the meeting is being recorded. So of course we can keep track of all this. And thanks also for bringing about the very much boiling ongoing situation. Of course, um, the, the, the grounds on which these projects have taken off are now a little bit shaky. 
uh, because of recent developments that will imp def definitely impinge on the further, uh, let's say, developments going forward in terms of agricultural production and also energy production in the EU, as was also explained before. Um, we are at 3.50, if my clock is correct. So I think I can go for a quick final round of questions before I open the floor to questions, because I see some questions and comments in the chat. So I will definitely get, actually come back to that as well. I will just go full circle and then come back to Mirko Barbero then. Um, again, probably a point that has been already addressed in a way. Zooming in a bit on the bioenergy side um, and in relation to the, again, developments related to the soil protection or soil flow uh, that is being uh, under consideration. Um, again, in your view, you have probably already answered to that, but I don't know, I don't know if you want to elaborate more on that. Um, do you see uh, the link between the policy framework of biofuels production and soil protection, specifically for a perspective of market premiums, again, to make the costs, which are still rather high, uh, in addition to cost cutting, cutting action technologies as, such as phyto remediation, as a key driver here uh, in the development of this new soil policy? Uh, can, you show, can you share with us some insights about that? So as this new soil policy in the EU is developing, is this link with biofuels production also in terms of sending price signals to the market a point uh, of discussion, and if not, uh, if so, to what extent uh, you see this as a prominent issue uh, in the in the upcoming developments? Thank you. Thank you. This is quite a broad question. Uh, I can only answer from the soil policy perspective. Uh, I can say that uh, I mean, when we aim at healthy soils, this means uh, that they are able to provide. Uh, uh, all ecosystem services uh, at the same time. I mean, uh, they are both uh, able to provide uh, food or wood or, or energy and climate uh, mitigation and adaptation and uh, water and nutrients uh, cycling and the basis for biodiversity. So all this all together because multifunctionality is the key for soil to, uh, to maximize what we get uh, out of them. But then when it comes uh, between uh, uh, competing uh, requests uh, for, uh, for uh, the use of, of soil, this is uh, another question for us. And uh, this is out of the scope of the soil health uh, law. So we, the, the aim, as I, as I said, is to, to set provisions uh, to achieve healthy soils, which means multifunctional then uh, how uh, they are used. This is uh, typically, so the, the use of land, uh, decision uh, what to use it for, that's typically a competence, which is mainly for member states because it requires the unanimity in the council. So that's why uh, when we, in the soil strategy, we speak about uh, land take, we are proposing uh, voluntary measures because we are calling member states to, uh, to take uh, voluntary measures in that uh, sense, because we know that uh, a legal uh, proposal would be uh, at a big risk of failure, yes, because, uh, as I said, uh, requires unanimity. So um, that's why we have to distinguish between environmental protection and uh, land use planning, with, which have different uh, uh, competencies. Yeah, in fact, this, this kind of silos or binding blocks approach, this is something that, uh, I mean, I think to our standpoint, it's still in the way in a bit when you want to address complex value chains such as those that are addressed by this project here. Uh, this is my personal take, um, but I do see your point. And hopefully just as a last point, this new conference on the future of Europe might spark some changes in terms of has, how decisions will be made in the energy field. So maybe there will be some, some developments uh, ahead uh, in this respect. Last question very quickly for Luca Montanarella before we uh, turn quickly again the look to the audience is uh, again uh, related to, uh, to phytoremediation as such, uh, which again, we will see, uh, we're seeing provides a lot of social benefits, environmental economic benefits. Um, however, we see, <clears throat> sorry, that there are of course several obstacles in the regulatory framework in order to uptake all these benefits. So do you believe that a way to stress these benefits would be to incorporate all the environmental and ecosystem benefits stemming from phytoremediation in the EU biodiversity framework? And would this send 
uh, write signals to farmers and policymakers in order to adoption to foster the adoption of such techniques in the EU. So do you see a role for biodiversity protection law in the EU in this respect uh, in relation to natural based solutions for soil protection? Um, compli complicated question, but um, I don't know if you have any thoughts on that. Um, the first thing that came to my mind is that probably the most polluted site in, the, in Europe, which is Chernobyl, is uh, known for being now a sort of biodiversity hotspot um, because of, of the fact that it's so heavily polluted that nobody should at least enter the site when it happens. Um, so it's a, it's a difficult question if biodiversity is favored by the fact that you um, plant often alien species to extract from the soil um, pollutants. Uh, it, it's, it's not uh, an easy question uh, because if you want to restore a polluted site or a contaminated site to its nature uh, status, uh, it's one thing. If you want to clean it up uh, a little bit in order to have other ecosystem services being uh, delivered. As Mirko was saying, that's the aim of the soil health law. So having soils delivering multiple ecosystem services, then it may, may make sense in the sense that if you lower the level of contamination to the level that that site could become even used for biomass or, bi or food production, uh, not for biofuel, but for, for, for consumption, uh, that that could be could be the ultimate goal, so that you have uh, one ecosystem service at least restored. Um, so the question is always to which to which status you want to restore a site. For example, you, we have examples in Europe of heavily contaminated sites being restored to become construction sites. So uh, a very contaminated site is, for example, the site where then the uh, German Environment Agency was built. Uh, the site of Uba in, in Dessau is an example of recycling a heavily contaminated land into uh, the, the hub of the Environment Agency of Germany. So um, it's all a question to which level of restoration you want to go of a contaminated site. And certainly phytoremediation is a tool that can be very helpful in, in achieving, uh, uh, in reducing the contamination on the site and then uh, allowing other ecosystem services to, 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 to become active again. Uh, because a degraded land means that it's not delivering anymore the de ecosystem services that it was delivering when it was in pristine status. So that's, that's the aim. Now, uh, if, if this answers your questions, I'm not so sure because uh, you were putting it very much the accent on placing this within biodiversity in the biodiversity strategy. Uh, phytoremediation is certainly not, uh, if you, in, this, in, the, in, in what I understand, um, directly increasing biodiversity. But of course, by lowering the level of contaminants, you may have uh, additional ecosystem services being been delivered. Uh, so it's all a, mat yeah. a matter of, of, where do you, of where do you want to go. But I repeat, it's again a matter of definitions, the, the definition of what you mean by biodiversity, definition of what you mean by uh, a, a, a contaminated sites. I mean, plenty of, of, of not easy questions that probably needs first to be answered before I can provide you a comprehensive answer to this, to this question. Sorry if I was yeah. maybe not completely exhaustive, but I'm trying to. You have, you have, covered, you have <laughs> covered quite some ground. You have covered quite some ground. And uh, you have pointed out that we need quite to work quite a lot. Uh, I mean, as far as I can tell, as a lawyer, on, on definitions that we need to also bridge gaps that exist between different policy blocks, uh, policy areas, including, for example, biodiversity, to understand the trade offs that are out there. And um, I would also like to follow up on this question with a question that has been spelled out in the chat, which is. Uh, I think somehow connected to the previous one, uh, to the last one, I mean. Uh, the question from Elisa Kavadin, uh, actually a colleague of ours at Hasselt. Uh, um, so do you believe that the future proposal for binding EU natural restoration targets would be relevant for phytoremediation? So going deep down into a specific point, natural restoration targets, what, what do you think about that? I mean, this is for the whole audience, eh? this is from uh, for the whole panel, this is from the audience. So feel free to raise your virtual hand, yes, no or elaborate on that. Mirko. 
the nature restoration law is not yet uh, adopted, so we, we don't know what, what's the content, but it was quite clear from the soil strategy that the addressing the remediation of contaminated sites, that's for the soil health law, uh, quite clearly. So, um, so restoring in the sense of uh, decontaminating and uh, remediating uh, contaminated sites. And well, to define as well what contaminated sites are, that's, uh, that's one of the, the, the things that should be addressed in the soil health law. Thanks for that. Any follow any follow up to this question? Because if not, I can drop the last one before we wrap up. If my reads allows, I see we are quite on time. I think we have time for one last point made by uh, Alexandra Triboy. Um, so the question goes um, that contaminated lands are different, mm, different specificities. So, do you think it is possible to start the pathway to healthy soils from some from somewhere? So, for example, to apply similar factor remediation techniques to similar types of activities, um, to similar types of um, contaminants of concern. This is a rather technical question, I would say. So maybe FT and Yoga can chip in on that. So um, the point is essentially whether we can apply similar factor remediation techniques to similar type of activities and then take it from there in order to mainstream it in a way. So I don't know if any of you have a neat answer to that. Uh, Mateo, I can say something, but I'm not an expert on fetal remediation. Uh, I'm just leading the project. I suppose that all the projects that they are going to offer case studies, they are a useful example how you can do the fetal remediation. But first of all, uh, they are, they, the difference are so, they vary a lot. So, and, and the mapping are, is missing also. So, okay, in general, can be done. And all the case studies at the end of the project, they will be good evidence. It's up to the, uh, to the policies, to the mapping, to, to, a, to a lot of things to say what is going to be done in each place. It's very complicated. It's too many parameters in, to solve this problem. But at least one start will be done with these three projects. Indeed, indeed. I don't know if Luca as uh, or Gheorghe have some follow-ups. I saw you were quite. I quite just, I just only want to make. Ah, uh, uh, please, Luca. You no, want to go ahead. Go uh, ahead. Um, no, no. I just wanted to to to, to make a comment, or following also the previous statement that uh, one round ago, probably that uh, I believe that the uh, the policy and the and the, and the regulations as we have them now in Europe, they can support actually the improvement of soil health also in particular with biofuel production to to my understanding the thing is how we are going also to incorporate uh fetal remediation in this uh, in this process so as to to, to close the loop uh, I, I understand that technically uh, there are uh, solutions yeah i'm not also an expert in, in all these uh, technologies or in, in the agronomic practices but uh, I, I can i can see that yeah, the solutions are out there, but I think that, that we just lack the the overall umbrella frame that could could link everything together, so as to have a more, let's say, uh, comprehensive uh, framework. And having said that, yeah, I also understand that following the um, 55 initiatives and uh, and all the, uh, the the EU soil strategy and so on, I think that uh, within the next few years, uh, this uh, it looks like the, the, the frame is going to be unified because I think that now we have reached to the point that uh, we feel or we understand that uh, as a whole in Europe, we cannot actually go and achieve the carbon neutrality target if we don't have this unifying thing. Luca. Thanks, Georg. Luca, please. No, just a final remark to say that I fully support the idea that uh, you need to start from somewhere, and probably the best place to start is locally. So, uh, and that's actually the vision that is behind this uh, core element of the new mission, the Soldi for Europe, which is the concept of living labs. So, the concepts of having local uh, implementation of research results together with the local stakeholders, together with the local administrators, together with the local uh, actors, which are farmers, landowners. I think uh, if you start doing in practice locally 
whatever is meaning, making sense in order to uh, improve the soil health is the best way to go. And, and each approach will be different. And if the approach becomes successful, it will become what is called in the mission a lighthouse in the sense it will become an example for others. And I think uh, I strongly believe in that because I think uh, each situation is different. Uh, and due also to the fact that soils are so different. So uh, soils are extremely diverse spatially. So in, in, in few meters distance, you can find completely different conditions. So you need to have uh, a local approach. And I think uh, the idea of, light, of, of living labs and lighthouses, which is the core of the entire mission uh, proposal, and actually the calls I think are coming out now in, in, the, in Horizon Europe, so you can also participate and I strongly encourage you. Uh, I think it would be beautiful, by the way, to have a, a living lab uh, showing uh, phytoremediation implemented in reality. Uh, so uh, I think that's the way to go, just as my closing remarks. Thanks a lot for the invitation and thanks. Well, thanks, Luca. I think we ended with a note of hope huh? uh, of what is uh, what are the, the propositions of the European Commission moving forward. Uh, the lighthouse is a very powerful metaphor, I think, uh, as we need to drive fast to, uh, to achieve all the challenges that have been stressed during this workshop and during this panel. So my turn to thank all of you uh, in this virtual room for joining this panel for the very insightful discussion. And of course, all the participants um, that have dropped questions and have interacted as much as possible, given the virtual setting. And now I think the screen should go back to Emma and Maurizio for the wrap up. Thank you once again, all of you. It's been a pleasure. Thank you, Matteo. Thank, Thank you, you to all the speakers. I think we are uh, behind the time. I would really like to, I hope, I, I really like the discussion in the chat uh, and I saw that the number of participants was quite steady. So I'm happy with that. I have no further um, remarks. Uh, there's a lot of thing, of work to do definitely in these three projects. Uh, Emma, I don't know if you have any final words. Uh, just uh, that I look forward to hearing the results of these three um, projects progress. It's going to be yeah. interesting. <laughs> Good, so I thank you for staying this long uh, and uh, I remind that all the slides, the presentations and the recordings will be available in the virtual platform and uh, all the three projects will also continue to, uh, to disseminate and to promote these, the outcomes of this uh, event and the future ones uh, on their respective social medias and websites. Uh, so stay tuned and, and uh, we hope to meet you in person at uh, our next event, so hopefully in person as soon as possible. Thank you. And uh, I think the closing session will be uh, starting soon. So I hope to see you there. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye. bye and thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you, everybody. Bye.